Welcome to day six, the last session of the Enterprise of Translation, a web series being organized by the Center for Translation and Digital Humanities and Film Society of Ravenshaw, Ravenshaw University. I'm Urmishri Badamatta, coordinator of the Center and Film Society. We are proud to welcome Dr. Gurdip Kaur Chawla, interpreter of the Prime Ministers and Presidents of the World. Dr. Chawla is joining us from California today. Dr. Chawla's life has been a challenging as well as a fascinating journey. After graduating from St. Stephen's College in New Delhi, she joined the Indian Parliament as a language interpreter in 1990 at the young age of 21. Her experience in the Indian Lok Sabha gave her the solid training necessary to interpret world leaders in conversation. She got her first big break when she was called by Obama's team for his first visit to India to meet former Prime Minister Manmohan Singh. She became part of history when she went live interpreting Prime Minister Narendra Modi's maiden, maiden speech at the United Nations General Assembly in September 2014. She had interpreted for Modi when he spoke at Madison Square Garden during that time in New York City. She was also interpreter for US President Donald Trump when he had visited India in February this year. Her shadow-like presence alongside the leaders had raised the curiosity of the Indian media at the time. Shaula is, Indian, is an uh, Indian American. She moved to the US in 1996. During her breaks from travels for international conferences, she works as an interpreter in federal and state courts and law firms. Shaula has also interpreted at the G20 summit, the World Bank, the Canadian Prime Minister's Office, the Department of Defense, and multinational companies such as Warner Brothers, Pfizer, Merck, and Pepsi. 15 years ago, Shaula founded the Indian Languages Services, which provides interpreting and translating services with new technologies. We hope Shaula's presence today will awaken our students to a hitherto underexplored but exciting area of life and occupation. Her job, as she has described elsewhere, is listening, analyzing, and interpreting all at the same time. When on job, she has no lifeline. During my interaction with you over the past few days, Gurdivji, I was struck by your warmth and graciousness, and most importantly, your incredible skill of keeping the communication channels open, which is the hallmark of a diplomatic interpreter. But before I formally enter into a conversation with you, let me welcome Professor Ishan Patro, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Ravensha University. Professor Patro is an eminent neuroscientist with around 40 years of experience in teaching and research. He is a fellow of the National Academy of Sciences, India, uh, the Indian Academy of Neurosciences, and Collegium International Neuropsychopharmacologicum and Honorary National Fellow at the Zoological Society, Calcutta. In 2018, Professor Ishan Patro was awarded the B.K. Bachawat Lifetime Achievement Award of the Indian Academy of Neurosciences. Professor Patro uh, will deliver his opening remarks before we begin the session. Welcome, sir. Good morning, uh, Gurdip. Good morning, all the participants, the, our team of uh, organizers at the Digital Humanities and Tra Translation Center and the Film Society of Ravensar. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have Gurdip here uh, speaking to us about her experiences in translating diplomats. And uh, well, uh, we, we are not uh, really uh, entitled to ask her anything on what happens in meetings, but she will express her views uh, as a trans translator, as an interpreter. And uh, this is uh, something uh, is going to really be helpful for our students and the youth in particular to understand uh, this important uh, uh, part of employment uh, in, in the world. Is, she is a very important lady in as far as uh, diplomatic relationships of this country and other countries are concerned. Mm -hmm. And I welcome you, uh, Gurdip, to uh, to discuss. And at the end of it, I may be uh, uh, speaking something about it. My understanding of this area is also very much limited. And um, let's let's start the conversation. Namaskar. Uh, welcome, Dr. Gurdip Kaur Chawla. Uh, before I begin, I would like to send out a disclaimer to our audience. Professor Patra has already mentioned it. Uh, Dr. Chawla, owing to her profession, would be bound by confidentiality restrictions. Um, but I hope, uh, despite that, we'll be able to get out from her as much as uh, we want to listen. 
Okay, so Gurdip ji, you've been interpreter for seven prime ministers of India, including yes. uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi and heads of other countries, including the U.S. presidents uh, Donald Trump and Barack Obama, the Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, and so on. Uh, having said that, let me say that most of us are um, not really aware of the difference between uh, translation and interpretation. How are they similar and how are they different? Our students would like you to introduce interpretation as an activity and as a career option through your own experiences in life. Namaskar, Shubh Prabhat, Sabko. And uh, now I'll start in English. <laughs> so, um, Urmi, thank you so much. And uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Dr. Patra, for inviting me, having me on your show. And I'm really fortunate that I'm able to speak to all your students. Uh, taking your first question, which is the difference between translation and interpretation. Uh, Urmi did speak a little bit about it. There's no lifeline, which is an interpretation. So let me start by um, translation is basically uh, when you have a script in front of you, you've given a document, a paper or anything, and you're asked to translate it. And you have all the time in the world, uh, you know, or whatever time is given to you to, and you have the luxury to um, consult a dictionary, call a friend, as they say, call a lifeline or whoever, or look at a glossary, dictionary, whatever you want, you know, or think about it for a little while and then, you know, formulate your uh, translation about it. So you have a time and uh, resources available at your hand. But in interpretation, it's real time, in lifetime. You're sitting with the leader or with uh, any speaker, whoever you're interpreting for, and you are speaking it life you know, life and uh, lifetime. And uh, there is no time to consult anybody, to ask anybody if you are stuck at a particular word or an expression, a metaphor, idiomatic expression, anything, or even a nuance, you know, you have to basically use whatever knowledge you have or whatever understanding you have, uh, you know, gotten so far and interpret it right then. And that's why you have to be very, very careful about each and every word that you say. Because every time that you speak anything that is, you know, misinterpreted, it is going to cause a huge problem for the speaker because you are basically representing the speaker. You are the alter ego of the speaker. And anything that you speak is taken as the word by the speaker, not by you. Okay. Um, let, let me, let us, uh, you know, we would like to know a little bit about how you began your journey. Yes. from your days in St. Stephen College in New Delhi and then to your days as an interpreter in Lok Sabha. How were your, uh, you know, let us let us le know a little more about your days of training as interpreter in the Lok Sabha. How intensive was it? And how did it really help you to groom yourself for the job ahead? So I was really fortunate, you know, when I had basically just graduated from college and I was still pursuing my master's degree and I got this big big offer from the parliament to join as a um, translator and then interpreter. Uh, oh, at that time, there were no universities uh, offering interpretation or translation course, at least not to my knowledge. Nowadays, there are plenty of universities, like you are starting translation interpretation courses, and there are many, many universities in India and abroad, and there are many schools that are teaching it too. But those days, it was, you know, if you have the skill in you, basically, they would test you if you have the spark, so to say, if you have the spark, and they saw the promise in you and you tested and you passed the test, you know, then there was a lot of training. So I trained for almost one and a half years um, by senior interpreters, really veteran interpreters who had been there for like many, many years, maybe 20 years, 15 years or so. And that was the real time interpretation training. It was not something that, you know, you go to a college university and you're taught in a few classes or in a few labs or in a few speeches. This was something that I was trained during the intercession when the parliament is not in session, it's called intercession. And then I was made to sit with them in the booth. And as they are interpreting, I'm observing them. And in between, they'll give me my two minutes, three minutes. Okay, you try it now. And if that worked, then I would continue. And, uh, you know, uh, that was like hands on training, as we call it, on the job training. So that mm -hmm. really helped me build up and boost my my confidence. And uh, slowly and steadily, I started interpreting then. OK. And uh, so now that we are talking about it, you are known to interpret 320 words per minute. Not uh, always, but there, there are times. You know, you know okay. Not everybody speaks that fast, but there mm -hmm. are times when people speak. So you have to be ready with that kind of okay. speed. So what, what do you think are the basic uh, 
personal uh, sorry qualities basic personal qualities which one requires to be able to interpret continuously and what are the absolute requirements of a diplomatic interpreter is there some specific terminology and language needed for political interpreting uh you know nobody becomes diplomatic interpreter overnight you know you there's a lot of training you know and there's a lot of um, self study discipline education that goes into it and even after like i've been interpreting 28 years now and i would still say i'm a student i'm still studying i'm still trying to learn everything i'll just give you an example you know i had interpreted for almost most of the political leaders in india when i came to us so it was easy for me to follow you know their terminology their language their style their rendition everything then came a time when prime minister narendra modi came into office you know he took the charge of the country and in i think it was 2014 if i'm not mistaken he was coming to the united states on his first state visit or you know so to say as a, as the prime minister of india and mm -hmm. i was i was asked by uh, the indian side to uh, the embassy of india to see if i can interpret for him at the united nations and that was his maiden speech his very first speech that he was giving and that would have given me goosebumps because i would have never i had never interpreted for modi ji in my life the good thing that happened here and this is where i'm i'm talking about self study and self discipline soon as prime minister modi took office and we knew you know he's now the prime minister i mean it's common sense that he will be visiting india or i will have a chance to interpret for him one day so i what i did was i went on youtube and i called out each and every speech that i could get that modi ji had given uh, ever since he became the prime minister and before that also when he was a chief minister of uh, gujarat what that does is that that gives you a grasp of what his style is how he speaks what kind of terminology he uses what kind of metaphors he uses and you know he's a man of words he's a wordsmith right mm. and he speaks from his heart he's not a person that would like you know okay give me a written speech you know or it's there on the you know on your screen and you're reading it out and he speaks out of his heart and so he did in the united nations as well each and every word and how he spoke about the neighboring country and all of that it was he I mean he he earned a lot of accolades for that so they needed somebody who could really deliver the emotion that he that he was bringing and you know not just the words words of course matter a lot you know you cannot as i said before you cannot even afford to speak misspeak a single expression because each expression means a lot but the emotion that he brought in the mm -hmm. passion with which he spoke the kind of um, force that was there in his voice all that has to be brought out to do justice to his speech and that's what the audience are going to look the audience in there and you know his speech was not only being heard by the 192 representatives of different countries or 192 heads of different countries but it was also being broadcast by bbc by cnn by all in, um by ztv and um, abbp i don't know all these are different channels and mm -hmm. they were all there and it was going live and everybody was hearing my voice you know everybody who was listening in english was listening to my voice if i had not brought in the same kind of emotion and the language expressions and the force that was there in his voice you know when he said something about the neighboring country or what india means and you know what we mean we mean business and you know we're going to prove it to the world and especially expressions like you know jab hamare engineer uh, ha, you know the expression he used was um bharat ko saaf sapero ka desh mana jata tha Mm -hmm. लेकिन आज के युग में जब हमारे इंजीनियर माउस के ऊपर उंगलियां घुमाते हैं तो सारी दुनिया देखती रह जाती है जस्ट इमेजिन दैट काइंड ऑफ एक्सप्रेशन इवन यू वुड एंड नो हाउ टू इंटरप्रेट दैट अनलेस यू आर रेडी फॉर इट एंड यू आर ओनली रेडी व्हेन यू व्हेन यू आर फैमिलियर विद दोस एक्सप्रेशंस एंड आई गॉट रेडी बिकॉज़ आई हैड लिसन टू ऑल हिज स्पीचेस इन द पास्ट सो दैट्स अ काइंड ऑफ पैशन दैट एन इंटरप्रेटर रिक्वायर्स इफ यू वांट टू डू जस्टिस to world leaders and you know to, uh, not just to world leaders i mean i do don't wor work just for the world leaders i do work for others also so i want to bring justice to each and every person that i'm interpreting for be it the world leader or anybody it is my job as a professional as an interpreter to bring the real force the real message to the forefront so that that's what my whole objective was and uh, you know after that i interpreted prabodhi ji many times you know i'm in fact after that i interpreted for him at the madison square garden where 16000 people had come and so many people were waiting outside and uh, 
Mm -hmm. Then, of course, you know, I was working uh, for the U.S. side. So there was bilateral talks I did and then, you know, all over in Canada and anywhere in G20s. And the journey just, you know, went on. And uh, so I'm glad that um, I've been able to do justice to it. OK. Uh, I do not know whether you'll be able to answer this, but um, would you like to tell us something about the personal quirks or the idiosyncratic manners of expression of some world leaders that you know that you I, found it difficult to interpret, or maybe you enjoyed it even when while you were interpreting? You know, um, I wouldn't call it idiosyncrasies or anything. I mean, whatever falls in our plate, we accept it. That's like the prasad that you're given. You know, you have to partake it and you have to take it gracefully. You mm -hmm. have to accept it and you have to, even if it is a challenge, you know, you have to accept it and you have to do the best you can. You cannot say, oh, you know, I'm just not going to interpret this, you know, or whatever it is, you have to be ready. It's like fire, you know, it's like bullets being thrown at you and you have to, you know, uh, take it and um, go in the stride. So whatever comes in your plate, you have to accept it and um, interpret it in the real spirit of the word. And, mm -hmm. and that's what practice helps you with. That's what self-discipline helps you with. That's what ongoing reading. I um, mean, all the time we are reading and embellishing our own vocabulary and styles of different leaders that we work with. But even with all that, have you experienced moments of exasperation and anger and frustration? No, no, no. We are not allowed. I mean, I mean, as a professional, as a professional, I'm not supposed to have any anger. Like I said, mm -hmm. Urmi, from the very beginning, that um, we are the alter ego of the speaker. So personal touch or personal emotions of anger, exasperation or frustration or any such thing doesn't come. I'm when I'm interpreting for the speaker, I am the speaker. I am in his shoes. I am in his skin. I am not Gurdeep Chavla. At that time, I am the speaker, the person who people are listening to. When when the speaker is speaking and the audience, be it in US or India or anywhere in the world, you know, they are listening to through BBC or through where whichever channel, CNN, anything. When they are listening to me, they are not listening to Gurdeep Chavla. They are listening to the speaker, whether it is President. Obama or Prime Minister Modi or Prime Minister Trudeau or anybody, you know, so to say. So I cannot bring my personal emotions. That luxury is not there. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> sometimes uh, when world leaders are in conversation, I do not know, you will be able to tell mm -hmm. us more about that. When they are in conversation, they might uh, be, uh, you know, silent for a while because of um, what you call not getting the desired outcome or because um, maybe the leader himself is angry or frustrated. Uh, or sometimes they also go fall back on rhetoric and, uh, you know, mm, passionately spell it out words. What do you do with that? I mean, do you really interpret them as they want it? Do you, I mean, have you always succeeded in conveying the impression that the leader wants to convey? Yes, that's that's the whole purpose. You know, if there is any emotion in that speech, you have to bring that out. You know, that's the secret of a successful interpreter, that you have to bring out the exact emotion, the exact feeling with which the speech is delivered. You don't paint it with your own emotions and you don't bring in your own personal touch or, you know, you don't try to, so to say, to crease the the thing you know that okay i can embellish it or i can make it look good that's not my job i have my job is to be very honest to the speech it is like the person who's listening should get the impression that he's listening to the real speaker not to gurdeep chabla but to the mm -hmm. real speaker that's mm -hmm. the challenge and you know god has been with me and he's been very graceful in helping me at that time i have emotions uh, and you know things that we have delivered in the real sense yeah, and uh, also, uh, did you have were there moments when you felt that it's better to be quiet than to interpret? Like, say, um, for example, there were some jokes or some, you know, anything. I do not know. Yeah, how yeah, it's yeah. As I've said before, uh, th if there are jokes, you have to uh, interpret those. If there is anything, you know, I mean, that is said, you have to be true to the word. You have to be true to the speech, and you have to be true to the speaker. It must be so hard to interpret the jokes, right? Because they are so culture specific. And uh, well, there are jokes. There's poetry. There is uh, metaphors. There is idioms. There's everything, and that's where you know how much practice you have and how much background you have studied and research. I mm -hmm. mean, I'll just give an example. If I go and interpret at a big event, international event, let's say 
say G20 or you know ASEAN summit or something. Mm -hmm. I don't go just like okay, I'm going to be interpreting for such and such leader. I go prepared with all the background. These are the arrows in my arsenal. You know, these are the my tools. You know, just like uh, you know a craftsman um, will not go will leave his house without his tools, right? Similarly, an interpreter, a true interpreter who wants to do justice to his work, will not leave his uh, home office or whatever without being equipped with his or no her, her knowledge. So if I'm going, I'm very well equipped. I'm reading everything that I can. You know, if G20 mm -hmm. economic summit, you know, I'm reading all about the two countries, what's happening between the two countries, what are the futures, what is going on in the past, what kind of meetings have taken place, what are the two countries looking up to, what are they expecting from each other, what desired results are there. If it's climate change, then, you know, what is it, what is it about climate change? Why is it so important? What has gone in the past? What are we expecting in the future? What are the dangers? Anything and everything that I can lay my hands on is what I have to study. And there are times, you know, when I'm traveling from US United States to another country, let's say I was at the um, climate summit in say in Paris or something, mm -hmm. uh, in my 10 hour journey, I'm studying about eight hours, you know, uh, about that or before that also. And it's an ongoing process. You don't just study just before the meeting. It's you're constantly studying. You're, you're self-educating yourself about any topic because you don't know. There are private mm -hmm. companies, there are private agencies that hire you for interpretation. And you can't just, you know, cannot say, OK, I'm going to be interpreting tomorrow. So let me start studying today. That doesn't help. It's an ongoing process. It's the, it's the education, the knowledge that you have acquired over the years that helps you when it comes to the real moment. OK. And do you also get listened to? I get to listen to their post lunch or post dinner conversations. And uh, Umi, I would, I would skip this question. I'm not oh. allowed to speak about that. I'm sorry. There's okay. confidentiality involved. Sure, no problem. Um, how important uh, is listening to your art of interpretation, and what does listening actually entail? When so you listen say listening, yeah, yeah, listening is the key component, so to say, for interpretation. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to be a very good listener because if you skip a word, an expression, or if your mind is distracted, you know, to something else, you know, oh, I have to do such and such work, or I have another meeting to go to, or, you know, my child is sick, or I have such and such work, or whatever. If you're distracted, you're not able to concentrate fully. You know, you have to have 100% focus on your work when you're interpreting. It's not like any other work, you know, okay, I can improve it later on, or I can embellish it later on, I can make any... This is a do or die event, you know, either you do it and you come out successful and you come out and say, yes, I did it and I did it right. And that's the expression that I want, you know, that's the result that I need as a professional, you know, uh, this is what I've always aimed at. This is my target. I don't let any ideas come in my mind and listening is the art, is the skill that any interpreter needs. Because when we are interpreting, there is three way process going on. I'm listening to the speaker, as mm -hmm. I'm listening, my mind is also analyzing that sub that sentence. And then I'm delivering that subject in a different language. So that mental translation has already taken place. So when I'm delivering sentence A, my ears are now listening to sentence B, and my mind is actually analyzing and converting, and converting it into a different language. And my mouth then speaks that in a different language, interprets it. And now my mind is, you know, my ears are now taking the sentence C, sentence number three, so to say. So it's a three way process, listening, analyzing, interpreting. And nowadays, I would say there is a fourth uh, dimension attached to it with all this COVID thing going on. We also have all these Zoom calls because nothing is going, uh, you know, in person. So we are doing it all virtual. So we also have a chat session. So, you know, if there's a question or something, it, it comes in the chat. So there's a fourth dimension now attached to that. Mm -hmm. And you were also talking, you know, during your conversations, uh, informal conversations, you were also talking about things like simultaneous and consecutive uh, interpretation. Okay. Uh, some, some, a little more about that. Sure. So there are. Um, at least three major uh, types of interpretation, so to say. The first mm -hmm. one is, uh, you know, where most 
most um, students would um, start with. Uh, let's say if you have to go to a doctor's office, doctor's clinic in India, we say clinic. So India, uh, you go to a doctor's clinic and the doctor says something and, you know, um, the patient doesn't understand. So they call a, an interpreter who could be just a starter, you know, a new, in, new interpreter, so to say. So the doctor says something, he stops, and then the interpreter picks it up, interpreter interprets it, and um, then the doctor says his next thing. So that's called consecutive interpretation, right? So there's pause. The, the doctor speaks, he gives a pause, interpreter speaks, and then the doctor picks up. Okay. And the interpreter can take notes at that time. And uh, then, you know, if he wants to, or if he can have a good memory, he can always interpret uh, out of memory also. Then there is a simultaneous in which uh, there is no pause, there is no gap given. Basically, the speaker is speaking, and you are either sitting in a booth or you're sitting live, you know, uh, across from the speaker, and you're interpreting as the speaker is speaking. So, if the speaker starts with this, maybe just a little bit, we call decalogue, like a uh, five seconds, six seconds delay, and the interpreter starts it. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so that interpretation is called simultaneous, which, which is live. There is no time That's to think. That's yeah, that's what you do in the conference presentation. Correct, correct, correct. And then the above that is the conference level interpretation, which is what you said 320 words and all that. I mean, speakers don't go as high, but some do. So you have to be ready with uh, 320 words up to 320 words uh, of speech where you have to interpret. So mm -hmm. that's that's like a like a very higher level, very highly skilled kind of interpretation, which comes after many, many years of um, experience. Mm -hmm. So, and then uh, of course, you know, as a diplomatic interpreter, you are doing both. But then mm -hmm. again, I, as you know, if there is a bilateral talk between two countries, it could be, you know, whoever, and uh, you are then um, the president or the prime minister, whoever is speaking, they speak because they, they don't like, you know, to be uh, shadowed by the interpretation at that time because their chain of thoughts is uh, uh, broken when they are speaking and you're speaking at the same time. Of course, okay. if you're sitting in a booth setting, you know, there are interpretation booths. So if you're mm -hmm. sitting in a booth and you're watching them in the same room, then you can do simultaneous. But if you're sitting with them on the same table and mm -hmm. interpreting with them uh, as they speak, then they have to they give a pause. They speak maybe a few sentences, whatever. And the interpreter has uh, that time the luxury to either take the notes or have a mental note or whatever. I mean, certain important words, certain important expressions, numbers, figures, names of the cities, towns, whatever comes up or it could be a pharmaceutical related uh, conference. So you need to know all the names of the, the medicines, for example. So you need to take down those names. These days, for example, I'm interpreting for WHO, the World Health Organization. And there are so many different medicines that are coming in, there are so many pharmaceuticals that are coming up, you know. So you need to know all those names, you know, uh, hydrochloroquine and remedies where and all those names that come up. So you need to, you know, basically just write them quickly so that when you interpret, you um, can look at them quickly. And, you know, not everything can be written, but mm -hmm. uh, yeah, whatever best you can, and plus your memory. Okay, and as an interpreter, do you have the freedom to interrupt the conversation if you cannot no. hear properly? No, you don't. You don't. You know, you try your best to listen. That's why I said there has to be a hundred percent focus. And mm -hmm. if you have the hundred percent focus, then you don't need to. Uh, okay. I've not had, but there are times, and of course, if you didn't hear anything, and you know, you are in a big bilateral meeting, you don't want to ruin the relationship between two countries. So then mm -hmm. maybe you have to rightly tell the leader that you're interpreting for that, you know, sir, madam, you know, can you please repeat that, you know, or uh, did I hear it right? But mm -hmm. uh, as such, we try not to do that because that kind of breaks their chain of thought and it uh, it's not very professional on our part. It basically shows some laughs. But of course, if there is some issue and you didn't hear, you have to. Mm -hmm. And do you also sometimes interpret, do you have what, what they call the telephonic uh, I mean, do you also get to interpret while the leaders are on telephonic conversation or something like that? Or no? Yes, we do. We do sometimes, mm -hmm. but I mm -hmm. cannot go in any details of that. Okay, okay. And uh, <clears throat> uh, what would you say about the Englishes that all these leaders use? You know, just some uh, one or two anecdotes, maybe the the Englishes that these leaders use because you have interpreted for the American president, for the Canadian, for the Indian uh, prime minister. So uh, what are the different kinds of Englishes that they speak? And are there any other some, uh, I mean, what, uh, how, how difficult or easy do you find or uh, to, to interpret when you move across so many Englishes all at one time? 
See, basic English is the same, you know. I mean, there are some expressions and some idiomatic expressions probably that are different. But, yeah. you know, over the years, as you are interpreting, you do get familiarized with most of the expressions. And as I say, there's a lot of self-study. We do take trainings. We do take courses. You know, every year we do a number of hours of training just to get acclimatized with different styles and different, um, you know, Englishes, as you said, of different nations, different countries. So, yeah. You know, an Australian leader, for example, his accent will be totally different from what we are yeah. used to in, in America or in India. Mm -hmm. So, I you know, I'll just tell you a joke. You know, one of my friends was telling me he's an interpreter and he's like, this person was saying, uh, I want to go there to die. So he says, why is he saying he wants to die? I said, no, he says, I want to go there today. So mm -hmm. to die, you know. <laughs> so, so yeah, the expressions are, you know, the way they speak, the accents are different, but basic English is uh, almost the same. The idiomatic expressions do change, uh, and that's why we have all these trainings. And uh, uh, even even though I do impart training to other people, I myself, you know, I keep training myself. You know, I do go and take these kind of classes and trainings, certain number of hours every year. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, the last, my last question for you and then we will go to the students questions sure uh, how about the ambiguities uh, ambiguity of expressions or uh, how have you come across such ambiguities when world leaders are in conversation or when any of these people are in conversation are these ambiguities often deliberate or are they um, you know by we can, can we skip this question Again, oh. I don't want to bring anything that is personal to the leaders. Okay. Uh, we have certain confidentiality that we have to observe. So, sure. yeah, if you can uh, sure. ask me any other question that is not yeah, just uh, one personal. Last, one, yeah. last, one last question. This is uh, from a student. She says that uh, we have seen images of you uh, sitting behind the leaders with a notepad in hand and with a pen in hand. What do you do with that notepad? Because you are... You know, right, 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 right. I, I think I answered that just a little bit before. There mm -hmm. are expressions that I said, you know, there are names. Sometimes mm -hmm. there are uh, expressions. There are numbers sometimes thrown at. And mostly mm -hmm. in bilateral talks, like I said, between the two leaders, you know, of two countries, mm -hmm. that is called bilateral talk. That's mm -hmm. when the leader would speak and he would stop and then you interpret. So you cannot remember each and every name or each and every number. I mean, the number could be seven, eight digits long, right? So you cannot mm -hmm. remember that. So you quickly kind of scribble it down on the notepad. Or there could be names, you know, of certain meetings or certain happenings or certain, let's say these days in WHO, for example, the names of certain medicines that are coming up, what other mm -hmm. countries are doing and, you know, what the initiatives are. And uh, so all those expressions that you think that you will not be able to remember, you jot them down. So these are kind of like the hot points, you know, that you jot down for yourself. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and then you can um, uh, look at them, you know, as you're interpreting. You don't depend on them totally. You're not noting down word for word, but certain mm -hmm. expressions you do note down. Okay, we have another question. Sure. Uh, please share some incidents when a word or a phrase fails you with an equivalent at that moment and how you overcame it. Okay, uh, yeah, by, very by interesting. You know, this is a question that a lot of people have asked me. Have, has there been any moment when you found yourself dumbfounded, you know, oh, you didn't know how to say it? And mm -hmm. my my answer always is that when you go there, you don't keep just one arrow in your armor. You go with many arrows. So you don't go with just one expression. Basically, you need to have many, many, many expressions for every word, like mm -hmm. synonyms, you know? So if one word is, a, is um, you know, ditching you, it's not coming in your memory, you should immediately be, you know, reminded of another expression. Okay, how do I say this, you know? So that expression may not be very, very um, say for one word, you may have to use two or three words, you know, to explain it, but it mm -hmm. will come to you. And that again is, you know, how much training you have given yourself, how much self-study you have done, and how much seriously you've taken that subject. So you need to have a whole big glossary, you know, in your memory mm -hmm. that you cannot consult, but yes, your brain will tell you this is expression. Okay. Another vice chancellor would be coming in. He has some questions for you. Sure. Uh, Namaskar, sir. Namaskar. Wonderful. Namaskar. It's wonderful. Uh, I, I would uh, I would like to tell my students to learn this from you that you said 20 years on, you are still learning. 
Yes, uh, yes. It's a life is a <laughs> journey of learning. Ask me, ask me. I'll say forty years on, I'm still yeah, learning. Exactly. And uh, th this is something that the 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 youth today needs to be told very very clearly. Yes. And because they are in a hurry all the time. Always. Yeah. I got uh, I got something um, I, something to not to ask exactly to discuss with you. Uh, this one thing that I I loved you saying this that the passion for the job. I always tell my students, you don't do research. Mm -hmm. Have a passion for research. Yes, that's something uh, yes. that makes you really different one. And uh, the more you are uh, into it, the more uh, better you become, and more uh, people seek you to be there. Okay. Um, I I I could understand one thing from your like uh, your uh, discussion is that you you are definitely not an actor when you are sitting there, but still you are acting for the person you are interpreting. Yeah. In, um, in 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 true sense, I would I would say, uh, it's, it's for me. I can never be an interpreter because it's so difficult to hold your emotion, particularly when it comes to two countries and you are interpreting for your leader, and yes. the other person is speaking about your country. Maybe many times making statements which you 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 think is nonsense. Why should he be saying that for uh, for for my country or to my leader? Uh, and I mean, controlling the emotion there is really, really a very difficult job. Uh, in doing this, I, the question comes now, in this process of doing this, controlling your emotion all the time, do you find that it comes to your, uh, I mean, the family also, when people are in the family and you are there, there and uh, you, you control your emotion so much or what you do there, does it come yeah. to your... Does it yeah, come in your, personal life, you mean, does it come in my personal yeah. life? Is that your question? Yeah. Yes. I mean, you know, we are all human beings, you know, we do have our moments of um, emotions, you know, when um, somebody in your family is sick, for example, you are, uh, you know, touched by it. And I would like to share with you that uh, at this time, my mom is very sick in India. And uh, I was almost about to cancel this because, you know, I was thinking if I should uh, go visit her and I was looking at um, plane tickets and all that. I was... But, you know, you don't bring it. I mean, you're a professional. If you have made a commitment, you made a commitment. You have to fulfill that. So I didn't tell anybody. I'm like, okay, you know, you uh, you have to overcome them, you know. Yeah, the, the other thing I, I, I would, uh, Urmi had already asked you this question, but uh, but any anytime you've, you've felt that uh, the vocabulary of the person you're interpreting sometimes goes uh, much above uh, the limits that you have, and uh, sometimes do you think uh, do, do you think the leaders do have such a uh, high uh, vocabulary yes so that, yes certain uh, leaders do you know i mean i don't want to name anybody but i have worked with I many leaders so. many leaders uh, and especially when i was working in the indian parliament i remember you know i worked with the prime ministers from pv narasimha rao onwards and uh, you know each one had a very very rich vocabulary as a starter as a beginner there i mean there were times when you know i was like okay how do i say this and that's why we uh, you know all this training uh, came in handy you know uh, they would not put, put us in the interpretation booths you know where we interpreted from unless we were really ready so we i um, mean culled out speeches after speeches after speeches like hundreds and hundreds of speeches before we went into a live setting where we were going to be interpreting. So uh, one becomes familiar with the terminology and vocabulary, as I said, you know, by reading and listening to those speeches and practicing them again and again. But yes, each each uh, leader has his own style and some have very, very extremely rich vocabulary. You have mm -hmm. to match that. I mean, you have to follow the register of the, the speaker. If he's speaking in a certain register, you cannot downplay that because then you're not uh, doing justice to him or his uh, speech. Gurdip, in my uh, lifetime, starting from being a student or researcher till now, I have reached this uh, chair. Uh, I have been meeting to many people who, who really mean a lot to us, my mm -hmm. mentors and everybody. Right. So uh, what happens is every time I meet somebody who is uh, better than the other person, we start uh, comparing the two somewhere in our mind, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe this happens with politicians much more than than uh, than than the academicians and laymen, uh, you know, when when the uh, prime minister changes or any leader changes, right. and we start comparing these two people, and then we start making our uh, views about this one, that one was better than this, or this one is better than that, mm -hmm. and uh, naturally the other uh, lobby that the party that we like or what party line and everything else. Mm -hmm. What happens to you because you are meeting all the people. 
uh, who are uh, really at the t you know t level top level and mm -hmm. they are the best at that given point of time chosen by people or because of their work because of their uh, i mean whatever they yeah. are the best at that point of time yeah, so yeah. you have been working with many best people you know at that particular right. time. Correct. when you repeat one best person the other best person's ways and things does it come into your uh, mind sometime or what this fellow is saying that fellow was telling better than what this man is saying like that you know yeah i mean you know each person has his own style and um, i mean they are all excellent excellent orators so would i say you know all the leaders that are working otherwise, with, otherwise yeah, they would not they would not be in that office yeah, yeah they would not be in that position so to say yeah. so yeah each person has his own style and our work as an interpreter is not to make any comparison our work is as a professional interpreter to do justice to that particular leader who we are working at that time so i have to be in the moment so to say you know i cannot I go back I, I, Yeah. Question is, my question is a little different. My question sure. is this comparison in your mind because we are human beings. You yeah, know? yeah, definitely. So that, that particular 20 minutes you may not have a comparison, mm -hmm. but in your mind you must be having comparison about people. You know, we we have got likings and dislikings, uh, strong or uh, weak. That doesn't matter. But mm -hmm. everywhere we got something that to compare one person with the other person. What I ask is how how much it influenced you or your work. Uh, I mean. Uh, not when you are interpreting otherwise you know at the back of my mind maybe i'm thinking but uh, you know as i said when i am there i have no luxury or no liberty to make any comparison even in my mind because if i start making comparisons i will be diverted i will be distracted so i'm my focus is just like you know um, in the mahabharat uh, arjun when he's uh, using his arrow and bow his aim is at a target you know he has to shoot his arrow in the bull's eye right that's exactly we are you know if i am listening to say narendra modi ji i have to only be focused on him if i was listening to manmohan singh ji dr manmohan singh you know the previous prime minister my aim was only his language and his vocabulary so now if i'm interpreting for modi ji i'm not going to compare you know how would have manmohan singh ji said this if he was in his place my aim is you know i have to do justice to exactly what he has spoken the spoken word is our bible okay, okay. i'll i'll have just two more uh, quick sure. things one yeah. is very uh, maybe it is very personal you may not like to answer it also if you don't 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 answer it i i want to know after i mean any time i have talked to a person like uh, like a prime minister or a chief minister when i come back the person lives with me for a long time It I keep on I keep on thinking about that man because these people are extraordinary. Yeah. They have something extra extraordinary. That is why they are in that office. And you go and talk to a person. That there's two things happen where you are emotionally very much uh, overwhelmed. That uh, well, I talk to this man, and then there are certain things that comes into your uh, personality that I should be doing the way he did it like this. You know. So uh, uh, how long a, a person's uh, I mean aura or the uh, the person himself lives with you for after you have interpreted him forever i would say yeah. forever you know exactly. yeah it, it exactly stays exactly what the I memories yeah the memories do stay especially uh, yeah. you know i give an example um, my favorite orator so would say you know is sushma swaraj ji and i was oh, so pleased yeah one, i mean one. she had the perfect command on both english and hindi and i respected her from my heart you know i mean i i haven't seen an orator like him a uh, lot sort of like her and i haven't uh, i'm there are many i mean i don't want to name anybody but i had special a uh, kind of soft corner regard respect for her and she commended my work many times and especially you know i was in bilateral talks and i was very conscious because i knew i was sitting right opposite to her on the table and i was interpreting from english into hindi for the prime minister of india and uh, she's sitting right across from me and as i'm interpreting i'm like what if i make a slip what if i make a mistake <laughs> she because she knows she has a mastery on both languages equally well english as well as hindi one slip and she's going to catch it but i was amazed when i was interpreting and suddenly i looked at her and she's looking at me smiling and she's nodding like this and that boosted <laughs> my you know my whole um, confidence at that time and then she commented me later on and like you been in united states for so long and you know you have such good mastery on hindi and all that so i told her you know ma'am i have interpreted for you also in the parliament many years ago and she was very happy 
See, the, you partially answered my last question. Okay. I, I, I'm a, I'm See, a I, I'm a clairvoyant. I can read your mind. <laughs> <laughs> See, that is what I when I speak to my uh, my colleagues, uh, not not in conferences. Uh, mm -hmm. They are of course I stick to my English. But when I talk to my colleagues or when I address my faculty, right. uh, I keep skipping from English to Hindi to Oriya and then come back to Hindi or English, something like that. Correct, no? correct, correct. So uh, they they they. they there would be many uh, circumstances like this for you also. How, how do you really uh, score a person like me, a stupid man using so many languages Please. or a difficult, <laughs> difficult person? It's so difficult to interpret this man. Or uh, how, how, do, how do you feel about people like me who, who use more than one language? At the, I mean, we had a uh, seminar, a webinar yesterday on uh, bilingualism and multilingualism. Right. So uh, how do you, how do you take it really? Uh, most of the time, the leaders that I've interpreted for only speak one language. Okay. I mean, they are I Hindi, for example, or English, you know. Uh, sometimes there are, you know, certain, I would say, sprinkles of other expressions from other languages. Like there could be some sprinkling of Urdu. For example, when I was interpreting in the parliament in India, mm -hmm. there, were, there were members of parliament or some ministers that would uh, be speaking. It's when they stood up, we were told they're speaking Hindi, but their language will be so laced with Urdu words or with Punjabi words. So I am fluent in uh, Punjabi and Urdu as well. So I was specially given those speakers, like, you know, okay, Gurdip will be interpreting those. So yeah, I mean, I try to do as much justice as I can, you know, to those um, speakers. But if somebody was to speak in Oriya, then I will not be in that booth. And of course, we know that that person is going to be speaking in Oriya or Assamese or some language that I don't, then there are interpreters to cover those different languages. Yeah, and, uh, what, I, what I love the most uh, in your uh, all that you said is uh, you, you are not going to uh, get out of this profession for long, long time no. because, because yeah. you are uh, teaching. You know, when you do a job and you convert it into teaching, that becomes the best thing. Yes, that you know, you a perfect person. You know, perfect. you are not yeah. doing your job, you are also teaching the youth, uh, young yes. people to yes. get into this type of. Uh, a, a job that you are doing and it's a very difficult one and uh, Urmi will of, of course formally thank you but I'm, I must thank you very much. No, no, it was for, my pleasure. Uh, for for an, an, uh, at least uh, enlightening me a lot whenever no, I no, see no. the Peter between two leaders I, I always feel how poor this person is. He has to say everything that this fellow says and there should not be any mistake, any thing. Yeah. You, know. you have to be, you know, you have to try your best. And yeah, as I said, you know, life is all about education. And, I'm, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. I, I don't want to take my skill with me. You know, whatever I've learned, I want to impart it to anybody who wants to learn it. Yeah. And it is my proud privilege that, you know, you guys invited me and had me talk to you. If I, can ask you if I can ask you one, sure. just my curiosity. Yeah. What do you think? A male is a better interpreter, or a female is a. I'll 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 give my answer after this. A female is a better interpreter. Mm, you know, if I say female, then I'm being biased. You know, I'm saying I'm the best, right? <laughs> but I don't know. Um, you want to know my answer? I'm a neuroscientist. I would say the female does it better. You know, because uh, if really a female does it much better than a male. Uh, uh, I can I can go on speaking on this for ten minutes, but I don't want to do it. Now. We can chat on that, yeah, yeah sometime. Yeah. You know, I would yeah. like to know why you think females are better. Okay. I mean, I, I, all I can tell you is that um, all the worldwide interpreters that I know, and I'm you know, I'm member of many many such associations, like you know, the Association of American in, in, uh, Language Experts and American in Translator Association, many associations, and all the interpreters that I know in the world, the majority of them, you're right, are women. You know, the majority is a women because we are not good sinks. You know, we, the way you said, you can you can regulate your emotions. You can you can really dump everything aside and say that what that fellow is telling exactly the same emotion. You can mm -hmm. pass it on the, the male would not be able to do it. We uh, the male brain is uh, is is bad in that. Uh, we are not good uh, emotional sinks. You know, we cannot uh, put things uh, right. to corner do things so quickly. Our reactions are much faster and much uh, like impulsive. More, yeah, impulsive and more aggressive than than the. Right. There's a lot to be spoken about the male and the female brain, but then I always say the female brain is better. Thank you. Thank you very okay. much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Uh, but there's, there's one just question, you know, somebody has asked out of curiosity, and I would love you to take this. 
Madam, if opportunity uh, uh, is given to you to interpret Shashi Tharoor, what would be your approach? And uh, what do you think of the kind of words that he uses? And do you think it's uh, that would be a, a worthwhile assignment or something like that? I'll take the challenge, you know, uh, head on. <laughs> By the way, Shashi Tharoor and I went to the same college. Okay. We are both Stephanians. We are both from St. Stephen's College. And I know the vocabulary he uses. And uh, um, with due respect, you know, I am ready to take the challenge. That's all I would say. I have never interpreted for him. But I've mm -hmm. met him in different settings. And um, mm -hmm. yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure. Uh, Thank you, thank Dr. Gurdip Kaur Chawla. Thank My you. pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, thank uh, you, Dr. Patra. Today thank is you. the last day, and so I would like to thank my students, especially Shikha, Archana, Shubha, and Shiraj, who have been very instrumental in coordinating then, uh, these uh, these sessions together, taking care of the publicity, etc. And uh, I would also use this forum to, uh, <clears throat> to request the Vice Chancellor to uh, uh, to consider it as a personal request as well as a request on the behalf of the Center for Translation and Digital Humanities to allow us to um, keep in touch with Dr. Guldeep Kaur Chawla sure. to, so as to avail her services. Oh, and, yes. Uh, oh, oh, by all means. By all means. By all means. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Chawla will be talking about this more in detail. Uh, Anytime. After the Anytime. So, Anything I can do for your students or university will be my proud privilege. Thank we, you. Uh, if you agree, uh, we can possibly accept you as a, one of our adjunct faculty to the center. It will uh, be an I, honor I'll for write, me. Yeah, I'll write to you on that. My pleasure. Thank you. So much. Thank you, thank yeah. you, so much. Thank thank you, you Professor. Day. Thank you, Dr. Burmi and uh, uh, Professor. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.